Valerie is a senior consultant from our Montreal office with the Water Treatment Group. Thank you, Tammy. So, um, water treatment, uh, PFAS treatment in water. Uh, the main contaminant we're, we're going to be looking at is the PFOS and the PFOA. You see the two molecules there. Um, they're quite similar. They are long chains, so carbon. There's eight carbon molecule into them, and this thing should be treated the same way with the electroxidation because it's a non-selective chemical combustion treatment. And I'll show you this a little bit later. Okay, so before we design a treatment, a water treatment system, the first thing we look at is the discharge regulations or guidelines. And here is a table that summarizes the one that we're looking so far in order to design our system. So there's the, we have the guidelines for the PFOI and PFOS, and we also have the perchlorate guideline that I added here. Um, our, the Canada Drinking Water, Health, Health Canada Drinking Water Guideline, the MAC, is really the one we're looking at when we're in Canada. And you can see that for the PFOI, it's about uh, 200 nanograms per liters, and for the PFOS, it's 600 nanograms per liters. Then if you go across the border in US, you have the US EPA drinking water health advisory level, which are much stricter. So there's a 79 gram per liter for the PFOA, and the same thing for the PFOS, 79 gram per liter. We have the perchlorate that has a guideline in US, and not in Canada, and it's about 15,000 nanograms per liter, so 15 ppb. So just remember this number uh, during the presentation. I showed Michigan, and it's not drinking water. It's really for surface water, human health, non-cancer, non-drinking value. And you can see that uh, for the PFOI, it's higher, so less stringent, but still very stringent for the PFOS. And the perchlorate, it's more stringent, about 1.6 ppb. And finally, if you go all the way across the globe and you go to Australia for recreational purpose, uh, human health-based guidance, you will have uh, 700 nanogram per liter for the combined of PFOS and PFXS. But if you go for the PFOA alone, you can see that it's quite high, so 5,600. So depending on where we discharge the treated water, you can have a different um, criteria for the discharge effort. So knowing that in mind, um, there is some conventional technology that exists to treat PFAS in water. Um, and they are listed here. These are the dominating one. Of course, there's many other that are coming in too. But for now, uh, we can see that the activated carbon, uh, either granular or colloid, it's used to treat PFAS in water based on the adsorption mechanism. Uh, it's quite low in capital expenditure, CAPEX, but it has a quite high operating expenditure, the OPEX. Um, why? It's because you need to dispose of those media and you need to often um, dispose of them at high cost. Also, they are less effective in short-chain PFAS treatment. The second one is the ion exchange resin that you're probably familiar with. Um, it are mainly ionic resin. And the mechanism is an attraction based on the electrical charge of the contaminant that's going to replace the ion on the resin. This one, its advantage is it has a moderate um, capex, so not too expensive on the purchase, but you still have limitation because the resin, once they're contaminated with PFAS, you have to, if you do a single use, you have to incinerate the resin at high cost. And, or you can dispose or treat the PFAS contaminated reject stream that is a few percentage of the water treated. So it's still at a cost. And finally, it's moderately effective for the uh, short chain PFAS. And finally, the last one is reverse osmosis. You're probably familiar with this technology. Um, it's a, it works on the pressurized concentration gradient across a membrane in order to treat or to retain almost all of the ions and let only pass the water. Um, so there's a moderate capex to the reverse osmosis. It could be also a high capex depending on the uh, application. And the positive thing is it can remove short and long chain of PFAS. The limitation, again, there will be a disposal and treatment of a PFAS contaminated reject stream, a liquid reject stream. And depending on the water quality, it could be only 25% or 20%, but it could be as high as 50% of the uh, volume of water coming in that's going to come out as a reject stream. Plus, there is membrane filing, like any conventional RO, and pretreatment are often required. So knowing that conventional treatment works, but they can have some improvement, uh, at Golden, we were trying to look at other technology, novel, that can be used for the treatment of PFAS in water. And one of them that, um, after several research, 
in the literature we find out it was the boron doped diamond electro oxidation uh, technology you see a picture there on the right side why we select this technology is because it destroys PFAS in the water it doesn't transfer it to a media or a filter uh, it uses boron doped diamond electrode it's a very very fine specific material and those electrodes last for 10 years up to 25 years so they're really not consumables so that means a low OPEX they don't use chemicals they don't produce sludge they don't use filters or media to dispose of and finally it only use electricity so we thought it was a sustainable technology to look at the cons will be that the uh, electrodes are a high cost but we can mitigate that by uh, renting the equipment or doing a long-term leasing and we also know that the electro oxidation produce byproducts and uh, one of them is the perchlorate and we'll talk about that later on so electro oxidation how it works it's quite simple but the chemistry is complex so you need two electrodes and uh, you're going to apply a voltage between them and the current will pass and when this happens there's several chemical reactions that are happening at the surface of the electrodes on the anode, there's oxidation, so we call it anode oxidation, where your water will meet with the electrode and the electricity and produce addicts and radicals, OH dot, and electrons. There will be also another small reaction with the BDD electrode where the water will convert to oxygen as a gas and escape the solution. There is also the surface, when it's going to produce the OH radical, the OH radical will stick to the surface. And then if you have an organic contaminant in the water that meets the OH radical that is adsorbed, they're going to make a chemical combustion and then the OH radical will mineralize your contaminant all the way to CO2, like a normal combustion. So this is the main process. In the same time, if there's ions in solution, chlorides and other, you will produce byproduct like hypochlorite, so the bleach that we use in the water in, the, in our household, but the much diluted. You will produce chlorate, chloride and perchlorate. On the cathode side, it's basically a water electrolysis, so you're producing hydrogen that escapes the solution. Next slide. So this is the chemistry of the electrodes and what's happening in the solution and how we treat the PFAS is really with those OH radicals and electrons that are reacting with the PFAS. So we decided to do a small uh, scale setup where we purchase a BDD electrode. You can see it on the left side. We installed that in our Montreal uh, 3 dbd center. And the only equipment that you need is the power supply, the pump to circulate the water, your EO reactor that is installed on a wall and a beaker in a cooling vat. And that's pretty much it on the full scale as well. So you always put down under the fuel mood and then you run the reaction. So this is what we've done in collaboration with uh, McGill University based in Montreal. And they were responsible to analyze all the PFAS in water before and after treatment. Next slide. So we've done this work and then we got some um, experimental results. The first thing we did is to look to to use um, a control um, water, a control recipe of water where we use we spike PFOA and PFOS standard solution into a demineralized water in order to get a constant concentration uh, at the beginning of the experiment. And we've done a lot of work uh, to, find, to understand the adsorption and desorption of PFAS into the system uh, until we were confident that they were not interfering with the result we're presenting. So we used about 75 liters of PFAS water and we treated for 84 minutes. And we did that twice. So we have a duplicates for each point. That was very interesting because within 84 minutes, so a little bit more than an hour and a half, we we're able to reduce the PFAS and PFA, PFOA in a significant way. You can see the percentage of removal. So for the PFAS, we have 99.4% removal. And for the PFOA, 97% removal. They were quite good because it's extremely short amount of time. And 
these tests were done for us to really optimize the operating condition so that we can move on to real groundwater afterwards. So that's the next step we did. We, uh, this time we used real groundwater from a military site and we didn't spike the water with PFO or PFOS, we just used the water as is. We used one liter of this water and by tuning the experimental condition, within 60 minutes, we were able to reach the Health Canada drinking water guidelines. Um, so you can see here in the graph, uh, the guideline is 0.2 for the PFO and 0.6 for the PFOS. And we met them about even, I would say, starting at 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes, because the error bar is uh, covering them both, we are able to meet the guidelines. That was extremely positive results. The PFOS removal was the same, 99.7 percent removal, as in the synthetic water. But then the PFOI was a little bit lower, 84.6 percent. And I don't know if you can see in the graph, but the inlet concentration in this time for the PFOI was only one PPB level, so 1.17 in the graph. And we believe that it's mainly because of the low concentration that we have a lower uh, removal rate. And this is normal because Electrolysation, um, it's really a mass transport limitation process. So it makes sense that the lower concentration at the inlet make a slower reaction. During the same time, what we did is we optimized treatment time, current density, the water conditioning, and we were able to remove perchlorate uh, that were formed during the EU process up to 46 ppm down to 0.89 ppm. Uh, so that means that we were able to remove more than 99.9% of the perchlorate in water with the tuning of our process. So the next step for us would be to continue developing technique to reduce the, the perchlorate down to PPB level this time. So we have experimental results from the lab. So we went right away to cost estimate modeling, just to make sure that this technology is cost competitive uh, compared to the conventional technology. So we decided to compare electrooxidation with activated carbon, which is mainstream used. And the assumption was, okay, we do a class five cost estimate, so minus 50 plus 100% cost estimate. Treatment capacity of the hypothetical system will be 20 cubic meter per day, a small groundwater system. And the inlet concentration will assume the same for both. So the same as the groundwater that we did before. So 1.17 PPB of PFOA and 87 PPB of PFOS. And the final constitution, we said both need to meet the Health Canada drinking water guidelines. So 0.2 ppb for PFOA and 0.6 ppb for PFOS. We ran the number and then you see the table, uh, the result in the table. So in terms of capital expenditure, capex, no surprise, the BDD actually was 10 times higher in cost. But when you look compared to the activated carbon and disposal of the activated carbon that is used, but for the OPEX, it was half the OPEX, so half of the operating cost. So when you do a long-term analysis over 15 years, uh, BDD uh, electrooxidation is more advantageous or at least cost competitive compared to activated carbon and it's more uh, sustainable because there's no consumable associated to it. So we're very happy with those results and that's what makes, it, makes, makes us think that we need to continue working on this technology and demonstrate it on the pilot scale now on sites. So the lesson learned in future work is really we learned that electrooxidation using BDD can meet the PFOS and PFOA drinking water Canadian guidelines. Perchlorates are a byproduct of EU, like in any other electrooxidation product, and we're able to reduce the concentration to 0.89 ppm. In some jurisdictions, in some guidelines, they would be acceptable. In some other, we need to work further. So for future work, we have ongoing tests with conventional technique to reduce further the perchlorate down to PPB level. We are going also to test a second real groundwater with our system to confirm the destruction of PFAS and as well as other PFAS. And we are going to optimize the treatment to be able to reach the 70 PPT level of the USAP, which is quite low. Uh, 